Okay, so like I said, guys, we're not going to cover too much today. We're just covering um, the first brain experiments, and we're going to cover a little bit about hemispheric specialization, which you might remember you did a little bit about in year 10, previous e-psych as well. Um, so what we're doing today is we're just looking at the three types of first brain experiments, okay? And these are basically... Like, you know, in the beginning, um, when people were first trying to understand the structure of the brain and the function of the brain, um, last class we talked about the different theories that people, that those Greek philosophers and people kind of suggested for what the brain's function was. So today what we're going to look at is a little bit later into history, um, basically after medical advancements occurred, after people developed the tools and the technology to actually um, you know, kind of like um, delve into the brain or dig into the brain and actually dissect it and see what was happening in there. What kind of experiments were conducted to actually see the functioning or understand the functioning of the brain? And there are three that we're going to go through today. First one is called autopsy, which you might have heard of before already. The second one is called ablation. And the third one is called electrical brain stimulation. So these are the three that we're going to go through. Um, autopsy, which you might know is actually um, something that's conducted um, after a person is um, dead. Okay, so you might have heard of this if you've if you've watched like crime TV shows and stuff like that, where you know after the dead body is brought into the morgue or brought into that mortuary, they're basically just um, kind of opened up. Okay, and this is basically called the examination of a body. When we talk about this with reference to the brain, we talk about opening up the skull after a person has died to actually determine um, the cause of the death or the cause of the disease. So for example, if someone was um, you know, shot in the brain or shot in the head, we are able to understand where that bullet might have penetrated the brain. Or if a person, for example, suffered from a movement disorder, after we open up the brain, after that person obviously is dead, we might be able to see that, oh, okay, it's the frontal lobe of the brain that was damaged. And from that, we're able to then make a judgment that, okay, this person's uh, frontal lobe was damaged, which means that the frontal lobe um, must play a pretty big role in movement. Okay, these are stuff that we know now, but when they were first studying the brain and trying to understand what the brain was about, a lot of people didn't know about um, specific parts of the brain being involved in um, specific functions. So autopsies really did help us to understand, um, you know, what parts of the brain were involved in what functions by looking at how intact or how damaged that part of the brain was um, in a person's, um, you know, after a person had died of a certain cause or of a certain disease. So autopsies do involve going into the brain, do involve, um, you know, opening up the skull, cutting through, looking at the brain, looking at the brain's functioning and looking at what parts might have been damaged or destroyed or decaying. Okay, and that gives us an idea to make some judgment. Ablation is a little bit different. The main difference between autopsy and ablation is autopsy is conducted when you're kind of like dead, Okay, that should be a dead, <laughs> dead symbol there. And ablation is basically conducted when you're still alive. Okay, um, ablation is basically when you go in with a little drill or a little scalpel or some kind of instrument there, and you purposefully or deliberately destroy, disable or remove certain parts of the brain. Now, you might be thinking, oh my God, that sounds so, um, you know, that sounds so gruesome, that sounds so unethical, and it is. In fact, today, in modern day, we don't actually carry out brain ablation, but we have to remember that these three um, topics that we're looking at are the first brain experiments before any ethical principles came into play before people decided this is wrong versus this is right people were just going into especially um, surgeons and stuff were selecting certain people were disabling certain parts of their brain or destroying certain parts of their brain and seeing okay when I destroy um, the back part of this person's brain or the occipital lobe of this person's brain what are the changes in behavior that arise so that's what they were trying to judge damage one section what are the changes in behavior? Damage another section, what happens? So like I said, it's a deliberate or purposeful destruction of certain parts of the brain to see what will happen if I destroy that part of the brain. As you can imagine, this is very gruesome, very um, kind of invasive. Invasive means that it involves physically opening up a person's brain and not just examining it like we do in autopsy, but actually interfering, going in with a scalpel, going in with a little drill, actually destroying that part of the brain. So we say that this is an invasive procedure. And for that reason, we don't conduct these kinds of procedures today because they're very unethical and they could often lead to permanent damage as well. 
Okay, the last thing that we're looking at is electrical brain stimulation. So electrical brain stimulation is this idea that I can go in or that a person can go in and electrically stimulate a person's uh, brain in terms of a specific area. So for example, um, I can actually run an electrical current, a safe electrical current, low level, um, towards, towards a person's, a specific part of a person's skull. And if they, if because of that electrical current stimulation, a response is then seen, I would be able to say, okay, yes, that area of the brain is controlling or is involved in that response. Just to give you guys an example, if I'm running an electrical current through a person's brain or a person's skull, okay, pretend that's the skull, and the electrical current is going through the skull to maybe the top part of their head, okay? We know that the top part of the head, if you remember about the lobes of the brain, the top part of the head contains the parietal lobe, yeah? And we know that the parietal lobe is involved in sensation, so if the person, after the electrical current goes through the top part of their head, if they start saying that, oh, I'm feeling a little bit cold or I'm feeling a sensory experience there, we would then be able to confirm that, yes, when the electrical stimulation occurs to the parietal lobe or the top part of the head, um, sensory experience does happen or sensory experience is initiated, which means that, yes, I can confirm that the parietal lobe is involved in sensory experience. So that's what the electrical stimulation of the brain is. And I'll show you guys a quick video as to what that looks like in an actual lab setting. It doesn't, it sounds a little gruesome, but it's not actually gruesome. An ESB or electrical stimulation of the brain is something that we do use today. It is safe and it is ethical because we're not actually opening up the person's brain and playing surgery on their brain there. We're just um, running a safe electrical current through. So that's pretty safe and that is not dangerous or harmful um, for the patient. Okay, so those are the three first brain experiments that we um, go through. Now, in your worksheet booklet that you're going to work on after we finish the content for today, you only need to talk about two. Okay, so even though we've got three on this PowerPoint, you've only got two boxes in your worksheet, so you only need to talk about two of these first brain experiments. So those are the first brain experiments. And these are just like extra slides just for your own knowledge, especially because you guys don't have the textbook right now. But for the activity booklet, you don't really need to know it in this much detail. This is more so just for you to um, just get some extra insight or information into it. OK, so this is just basically showing us that through autopsy, we were able to or people were able to determine two other areas of the brain involved in language. And that's because they were able to look at the specific um, person who died and look at which areas of the brain had been damaged. For example, there was a patient who was not able to speak properly in proper grammatical sentences. And when he spoke, even though he was a grown adult, when he spoke, it sounded like he was a three-year-old, like he wouldn't use proper gram grammar in his sentences. It would be very difficult for him to string up a sentence. Like it would take him a good minute or two just to say a sentence that a normal person could say in maybe 10, 15 seconds. So um, after that man died, they opened up his brain and they actually found out that a specific area in the frontal lobe of the brain um, called the Broca's area, because it was discovered by... Um, a surgeon called Paul Broca um, and named after him, this Broca's area was actually really damaged and really decaying in that person who couldn't speak properly. So this led Paul Broca, the founder of the Broca's area, to basically conclude that because this guy had a lot of damage to the Broca's area, the Broca's area must be a part of the brain that's involved in speech production and the ability to string up um, grammatically correct sentences, the ability to speak in a very confident and fluent and clear way. Okay, so that's kind of like an example for you from your book. And we are going to learn about these two language areas in a little bit more depth later in the year as well. So just a quick introduction into them. Okay, so that's just a little bit more information about autopsy, um, about brain ablation. Again, you don't need to give all this information, but just understand who were the main people involved. Brain ablation, like we said, was um, is about deliberately destroying certain parts of the brain to understand what function that part of the brain plays. Um, the first experiments into brain ablation before humans were kind of used um, were first conducted on rabbits and pigeons, okay, as well as monkeys and chimpanzees, just because their brain structure kind of resembles um, humans' brain structure in some ways. So basically, Florence, which is the guy up here, he wanted to determine whether whether if he removed the cerebellum, which is like the back part of the brain, it's involved in movement, whether animals would actually find it hard to balance or to coordinate themselves, okay? And what he did 
um, that was his proposal or his theory. That was what he kind of predicted, that the cerebellum must play a role in balance and coordination and movement. And after his studies on brain ablation and destroying that part of the pigeon's brains, he was actually able to determine that this was true because every time he damaged the part of the pigeon's brain, the cerebellum, which was involved in movement or balance and coordination, he found that the pigeons could no longer walk in a very smooth way. They were kind of always kind of um, tipping over to one side or they were not able to maintain their balance. Okay, similarly, uh, Carl Lashy, which is this guy here, um, he used brain ablation to destroy certain parts of rats, monkeys, and chimpanzees' brains. And what he found was that when he damaged that area of the brain, these monkeys and chimpanzees were not able to engage in learning and memory as much. Okay, And he found that there was not just one area of the brain involved, but rather multiple areas. So if he damaged, for example, the side of the brain as well as the front of the brain, both of those areas of the brain are involved in learning and memory, okay? So he was able to determine or draw that conclusion from these animal experiments. Like we said before, though, one of the main issues with ablation is that it is extremely invasive because you are going in and as this picture suggests, you are kind of physically interfering with or destroying parts of the brain and a lot of the time that damage especially if done to humans luckily it's not done today anymore but especially when done to humans or animals can be irreversible okay which means that you can't undo that you can't just click an undo button or reverse that a lot of the time that brain damage can be permanent so that's one of the limitations or the ethical issues with ablation and then when we're looking at the electrical stimulation of the brain, this is just to do with that idea of running the electrical current through the person's brain and basically seeing what kind of changes um, will occur or what kind of um, changes in terms of the patient's response. The main person involved with this idea of electrical stimulation of the brain was a guy called Wilder Penfield, who's pictured here. Um, he is kind of known as the father of brain mapping and the father of electrical stimulation of the brain. He was the one who came up with this idea um, that, you know, certain parts of the brain are involved with certain functions. Okay, even though that was first brought up by Gull with his theory of phrenology, phrenology itself was discredited, but Wilder Penfield was able to take his idea of localization and build upon it and actually put a brain map. Okay, we call this brain mapping, where you tag certain parts of the brain. So if I tag the part of the brain here named 20, I might say this part of the brain is involved with uh, memory, for example. I might say tag number 10 here is involved with uh, visual perception or something like that. So basically brain mapping is when you tag certain parts of the brain and say that this part of the brain is involved in this function, whereas the other part of the brain is involved in another function, also known as localization of brain function. Okay, localization is another way of saying specification or specifying which parts of the brain are involved in which types of functions there. Um, now, Wilder Penfield used electrical brain stimulation um, with epilepsy patients. And on Friday, we're going to start talking about a specific type of surgery that was conducted for epilepsy patients um, called split brain surgery. But today we're just focusing on the first brain experiment. So that's the, that's the main idea that we want to look at. Okay, so I'm going to show you guys a video of what electrical stimulation of the brain kind of looks like. Okay, it's not as gruesome or as invasive. This is just looks invasive because this is the brain mapping, but this is not actually an image of how electrical stimulation of the brain occurs. Okay, so I want to show you guys that video so you can better visualize what it looks like for an electrode to be put on the scalp and what they kind of um, analyze or look at in terms of that. Um, so I want to play that video. So, oh, that's the content then for today. That's Good. Okay. That was quicker than I expected. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just stop the recording here.